I'm Christina Lees, and welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Christina Lees, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now, of course, you are an actress, but can you tell me, when you were growing up in Boston, what did you aspire to be? I wanted to be a vet, I thought, until I realized that vets didn't deal with, like, happy dogs and happy cats. They dealt with sick and dying ones, and that right. didn't seem, that wasn't what I wanted to spend my life doing. So then I thought I would um, maybe be an architect or something. Um, but then in my senior year of high school, I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker. And so I first got to know you as Carl in Child's Play 2. Can you tell me how you first heard about that role and what the audition process was like? Standard fare. You know, my agent saw there's a thing called Breakdowns, which casting directors put out and was the name of the project and all the different roles, the, the gender and the age and what they're like. Mm. And she submitted me. They had me in and I read for them. I didn't get it the first time around. Um, they saw a bunch of girls and they decided they hadn't found anyone that was right. So they went back and looked at the people that had been near misses. And I read for it again. And I guess I did something different because I guess <laughs> it was an unanimous decision to cast me. I love that. And I've just recently revisited the film and I loved it when it first came out. Obviously, I wasn't old enough to watch it at the time, but I did because it was, you know, the 90s. What are your favorite scenes looking back on it, either to film or just to watch when you're enjoying the movie? My favorite stuff as far as my stuff is the, when she's on the swing smoking a cigarette and she kicks out the little boot and finds the destroyed Chucky doll and goes to the trash can and sees the doll that she threw away is gone. So you watch her character sort of realize that maybe Chucky, that Andy's not lying, that Chucky really is real. Mm. And so that's sort of fun for me to watch. It was a film that I loved when it first came out, but it's since become my favorite Chucky film and I've looked online it seems to be everyone else's as well what do you attribute to the movie's lasting success I think that you got to see a lot more Chucky in the second one than in the first one and Mm. and you get into him right away it's not like a wait there's no long reveal for Chucky like there was in the first and I think people appreciated that I think they appreciated the comedy uh, that was brought in at that point and I think they also really like seeing two kids fight Chucky, two kids without mm-hmm. the assistance of adults. Um, that whole factory sequence uh, seems to be everyone's favorite. They call it the favorite scene, but really it's half the movie. Um, <laughs> it's, it's many, many scenes take place in one location, you know? Um, and I think the colorfulness of that set and the sort of scariness of two kids on their own fighting Chucky, I think, and I think kids really responded to the relationship between Kyle and Andy too. I think everybody sort of fantasizes about having a heroic bigger sister like that. And um, I think kids really respond to that. Definitely. And I was delighted to see you make a brief cameo at the end of Cult of Chucky. At the time, was that planned as just being a fun cameo or were there already ideas about what could happen afterwards? Well, I think given the trajectory of Alex Benson's character when he came back at the end of Curse and had so much more to do in Cult, mm. I think that was sort of the what Kyle was being teed up to come back and whatever the next installment of Chucky would be, whether it was another feature or the series, um, that, that was she was intended to be brought back from to do more. Right. When you first heard about the Chucky TV show, what was your reaction? Obviously, they at that point had rebooted the movie and had gone off in another direction but it was coming back with the original cast and the original creator and puppeteer and everything were you excited to return to that role after nearly 30 years of course i was the other checking movies had nothing to do with us so it's not it's not you know none of us from the original franchise had anything to do with that feature i haven't seen it um and so it's it's just not part of my reality at all uh, I knew the series was in development for years. It was already in development before COVID hit. So um, I was excited. I was I was afraid that that other movie might um, change the studio's mind about making the series. So I was sort of resentful of that movie existing because it may have derailed the whole Chucky TV show, which yeah. has, it didn't, thank goodness, you know, but it may have. Um, and I didn't know even what to root for as far as that film, whether I was rooting for it to fail or to succeed, because I didn't know which thing, what impact that would have on the studio's decision making, you know? So um, I was very excited to see that the show didn't get cock blocked by that film. And um, 
and certainly excited to go back. I was really excited two years ago when I went back to the reboot of 90210 to work with people that I've known for 30 years and play a character that I played at 17 and now I'm playing, you know, 40 or 50, or 50 really. Um, and and that show didn't wasn't as well received by the fans as this show has been. So to have a, a second chance in two years to play a character that's 30 years old is unheard of. Uh, it's like a miracle. Uh, and so, yeah, I was really excited to get a second chance to work with people that I love and consider family. Obviously, when you're, you're filming a show, you perhaps see the scenes that you're in, but not necessarily the entire production. Now that it's been broadcast, what do you think of Chucky season one with all the special effects and everything in there? Well, first of all, I, I read everything. So I, I know what everything, you know, I, um, and I'm allowed to be around uh, see things shot, but I wasn't for the most part. Um, it was un- unbelievable. It was so much better. It, it read, when I read them, they were better than I hoped they would be. And then mm-hmm. they jumped a gigantic stride forward with all how expensive it looks and how beautifully it's shot. And the special effects are amazing. The kids are incredibly talented and really charismatic and um appealing mm. um and i was i love the show i think i'm really proud of it i think it's fantastic i think everybody's great in it i think you know i'm, I'm really proud of the fans for being patient and falling and letting themselves fall in love with the new characters with, with mm. the kids with the kids parents and um that was a big um leap of faith i think for don to trust the fans to be patient and wait for the what for the you know for the original seven films to be brought back into the fray uh and they really really were and i think i think that the kids um it really smart on so many levels it introduced the, because of the kids an entire another generation of chucky fans have been born that hadn't even seen the feature films mm-hmm. and it kept people the old the old the fans of the franchise kept them baited you know and made them wait for the for the, the ogs to come back um Jennifer Tilly is brilliant. Jennifer can, chill, can make, you know, um, like long time no see, or I'm so sorry for your loss. These are simple sentences that most actors would throw away. And she can make a whole meal out of those simple sentences. She's just fucking brilliant. Uh, Fiona is playing like four characters. She's playing Nika. She's playing Nika possessed by Chucky. She's playing Nika possessed by Chucky pretending to be Nika. And then she's playing the young Charles Lee Ray. And she's got so much heavy lifting to do and she's just brilliant, I think. And then Alex and I get to come back and be, you know, the team that we once were. And it's just been really, really awesome. Did Don Mancini fill in some of the blanks of what Kyle and Andy have perhaps been up to since Child's Play 2? Or is that something you imagined or that might be explored in the future perhaps? It's possible that it would be explored in the future. It's not something we talked much about. We, we didn't mm-hmm. even really get into how, how Andy got out of the asylum. I guess the presumption would be um, that Kyle somehow got him out. Um, he wasn't committed to that in the, in the asylum. There's no reason to keep him there. I'd imagine once any staff or whatever found somebody locked in a padded cell who hadn't been an admitted patient, they would just let him go. Um, so it's not that difficult of uh, a scenario to envision. Um, and I just assume that's what happened. Um, but you, you've seen a little bit of what happened to Andy because you've seen him at the for four years he's been t- torturing a Chucky head and yeah. trying trying to date with you know no success and I think I think Andy's character the character of Andy is much more traumatized from the experiences than Kyle uh, largely because it began for him at six years old with way, far fewer skills to to, to deal with <laughs> a supernaturally possessed killer doll. <laughs> you know, when you're six years old, it's, a, it means, it's true for both Andy and for Alex that their earliest memories are of Chucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and then and some of mine too. Yeah, I mean, literally <laughs> Alex is, was six years old so that he doesn't have any memory of life without Chucky in it. And I think Fiona is probably similar in that regard and that her father's been doing it for most of her life. So, so many of us have had this doll in our lives for ever. It's, it's kind of cool. He is, uh, has been a friend to the end. That's for sure. Has the puppeteering changed much since Child's Play to, to Chucky? I know it's practical effects for the most part, but are there major differences or is Chucky kind of controlled in much the same way? There's two major differences, actually. One is that because of CGI now, um, the puppeteers are wearing black 
ninja outfits basically and they're in the frame in the frame with us and the camera's picking them up shooting them while they're manipulating the doll <laughs> that didn't used to be and they paint them out later on they went they shoot it and then paint them out the doll is never cgi the doll's all practical but um erasing the puppeteers is cgi and um that wasn't the case before they had to have wires and they had to be off camera and you couldn't see any of the mechanics of how he worked um, and the other thing is they're able to pre-record and pre-program his mouth. Uh, they used to have to do the mouth on set. They'd play um, Brad Dorff's voice playback. And then the puppeteers in, re in real time would try to get the mouth to match what the words were saying. And sometimes to make that easier, they would play the, they'd play the playback back at half pace. So the mouth would have more time to form the words. Now they can program the mouth ahead of time. So the mouth is already doing it all perfectly. And it's just the body movements they're trying to get right on set. That's amazing. And yeah. so in episode seven, Andy drives off and leaves you in order to keep you safe. And then in episode eight, you drug Jake and Lexi to keep them safe. And I was just thinking that if all the hero characters didn't go off by themselves, would there be more safety in numbers, do you think? Or because everyone's trying to keep everyone else safe, they all get picked off one by one? I think that the latter, I think safety in numbers for sure. Mm. Uh, and I think, it, I mean, Kyle, of course, is going to be held to pay, <laughs> assuming she survived the explosion. Um, and he's got hell to pay. Um, for leaving her like that and leaving her in the middle of some sketchy at some sketchy gas station in the middle of the night too <laughs> how much safer is that um but yeah we'll have, to, we'll have to see i mean and fingers crossed kyle survived the fact is she was sort of further away from the blast than the other characters were she's outside the building and they were not mm -hmm. uh, and they survived so um you know fingers crossed kyle made it too it's very true and Honestly, if you look back at all the other films, it kind of doesn't matter if people survive or not, because they're often still in it. Jennifer Tilly's died about three times, I think. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's, she's an immortal doll, though, so she's got that, that doll. That always helps. I just can't imagine that Dawn would kill Kyle off camera. If Kyle's right. going to die, you're going to see her die, and you're going to see her die in a really horrible way, you know? So, I mean, I just, I have to have confidence that uh, Kyle made it. Yeah. And what was your reaction when you first read the script of that explosion happening? Well, um, I didn't really have one. It's I, my, my primary, you know, when you read these things, I, I think it's true for every single actor on the show. We read them hoping and hoping and hoping that you don't die <laughs> because everybody wants to be around and stay in the family and be part of this Jackie family, you know, indefinitely. So, um, Don said, don't worry, don't worry. So I'm not going to worry, <laughs> but I'm still worried. <laughs> Me too. And so yeah. in, in episode seven, they make a big point of showing you buying yourself and Andy some leather gloves before you get ditched on the side of the road. And obviously there's this big explosion, but then the final shot is of that leather glove at the funeral on the tree. I know you can't necessarily say whether you're in season two or not, but could you tell me if it was your hand in that glove, whoever it turns out to be? I, it seems to me that it's Kyle's hand. It's left open on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a deal for season two, so I don't know for sure either way. It just seems to me again, like I don't, I can't imagine Dom will kill Kyle off camera in an explosion and that's that that's a waste of an incredible opportunity for a death yeah. a really controversial death i imagine too um and also i think that it seems to me the reasonable thing to assume that that's kyle because if it's not who the fuck is it it's not andy and yeah. and to do that whole thing with the leather gloves and then have it be somebody else other than kyle or andy would be cheating i think but you never yeah. know Unless someone's carrying your arm around or something, I don't know. Right, exactly. I love the character of Nika and I love the show, but I really did not enjoy what happened to her at the end of it. And of course, Fiona Dorf is an amazing actress, but do you think it's possible for Nika to have a happy ending at this point? Um, well, happy endings aren't what this show is about. That's true. <laughs> um, so who, who can say? She's still... She's still possessed is she not i mean she hasn't chucky hasn't been exercised from her that's why she's been rendered limbless is because mm -hmm. jennifer i mean you know 
Tiffany wants her helpless so that if she does become Chucky, she can't do anything. Um, so yeah, I mean, she survived. It's a big leap. This is a show not grounded in, in reality, right? So we're, we're meant to believe that Tiffany was able to cut off all four of her limbs and she didn't die from blood loss. You know, <laughs> we're going to accept that Tiffany is a master surgeon. They can perform four amputations effortlessly and, and pull them off. Um, so, you know, given that that's how much fantasy is allowed in the show, who, you know, who can say? Maybe Kyle was blown up and they're going to salvage her limbs from the wreckage and sew them back onto Nika. <laughs> who knows? As long as they still have you playing those limbs, that would be great. Just in a separate room. and then <laughs> Yeah. A great double act, I think. Podville act, yeah. Now, what is the key to surviving Chucky, having done it several times? The key to surviving Chucky is, is Don not killing you. <laughs> <laughs> if... Uh, and Don, you know, John, Don plotted to kill Kyle a while back, actually, and it didn't happen, thank God. Um, but it was a pretty spectacular death, too. It didn't happen because they couldn't afford to do it. So, <laughs> so that's one way Kyle survived, is they couldn't afford to kill her the way Don wanted to. So, so um, was that in the show or was that in a previous movie? It was going to be in Cult. Um, well, in Cult, but it didn't, ha- it didn't end up happening. What was it going to be in Curse? One of the, it's going to be in cult, um, but you know he he runs all kind. You know his his he stews things on things for a long time, and they they go they can start at point A and end up at point Z by the time he's well, by the time we're shooting it. You know, um, I I'm hoping that I'm hoping that Don agrees that the show does need some people more than just Andy to anchor the show in the franchise to anchor the show into the history of the franchise. So um, there are other characters that could come back to do that. There's the Catherine Hicks character and the cop and there's, you know, um, Harry Reeves uh, from three. And I mean, there's other characters, but I really feel like Andy and Kyle are because of Child's Play too, such fan favorites. Um, mm. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, fan feedback or fan backlash will keep uh, Kyle alive <laughs> for a long time. Looking back now, what were your favorite moments to film in season one of Chucky? Well, I didn't have that much to do in all fairness. Um, I, was in, I was in Toronto for eight weeks and I shot six days. Um, oh, really? Wow. Long, long time to be in Canada to do very little work. Um, but that, you know, the opening scene, the big, the Pulp Fiction scene as, as census takers was of course super badass. And then my scene at the end uh, in eight where I come and kill Chucky again, killing Chucky is always fun. So, and I was really happy that Alex let Kyle be the badass that she is, even though she's 50, you know, it's not a lot of television that lets 50 year old women be that cool. And so I'm grateful. For that did you get to keep any props or souvenirs or costumes from either Chucky or any of the productions you've worked on no um you don't get everyone thinks you get to keep things everyone thinks we all have a doll and we're t- dolls are like they just give them away willy-nilly or even walk off a set with props you cannot well, the dolls are worth a fortune and they all belong to they used to belong to Kevin Yeager now they belong to Tony Gardner mm-hmm. um they're his and he they're expensive and um and the props are belong to the property department or they're rented from somewhere else. They just, they, they belong to somebody else. They're not just stuff. And they keep them, um, even if you were, they keep them for future production too. They need these things to match if they, the houses, you know, the set, the sets and stuff have to match if they come back and they need to match, make, recreate those sets. All those things are important. So you don't get to keep much of anything. Sometimes you get to keep some clothing um, where they let you buy it a half price or whatever uh i the most significant piece of memorabilia i have from my career is that leather biker hat but i owned that leather biker hat before i was even an actor i kept getting i kept wearing that hat to auditions and getting jobs and then they let me wear the hat in the show so i wore it in child's play too i wore it i wore it in cult and I wore it in the show, and I wore it get a 90210, and I wore it in the reboot of 90210, and I wore it in 21 Jump Street, and I wore it in a ton of stuff. Um, it's my only real memento, and I brought it to my career. I didn't take it with me from a job, you know. I love that. And so here's a question I ask every guest on the Sarah O'Connell show. Can you tell me a fun fact about you, something you may not know, a hobby, a party trick, something like that? Well, um, a couple things. I'm a photographer. Uh, 
a lot of my photographs are for sale. If you go to uh, my pinup art, like pinup girl, mypinupart.com, my photography is all there and some Chucky shirts and stuff you can buy there. I wrote a novel. I wrote a dirty comedy novel called Bathing in the Single Girl. If you go to bathingbook.com, there's a film, a 10 minute short that I did first that you can see it works really well as a trailer for the book. And the book is super dirty and really raunchy comedy. It's not erotica. It's embarrassing, raunchy, terrible stories about bad sex with horrible men. Uh, and I'm a vegan and I have a vegan cooking channel on YouTube that you can get to by going to videovegan.com. And I do, I do a dog rescue. That's amazing. Speaking of your vegan recipes, which I love, by the way, have you got a favorite? No. Yeah, maybe. I think the one that I make the most is the Chinese, the barbecued Chinese ribs. Um, they're vegan. You make it with any kind of vegan chicken you can get. And there's a really great barbecue sauce recipe that you basically like cook it in a pan till it's almost black, like char it and it's sticky and spicy and sweet. And when I was a kid, when I ate meat, those, those red, those really red Chinese uh, pork ribs are a favorite of mine. And these things sort of replicate that pretty well. There's a rumor at one point, is it, can you tell me if this is true? So your character of Emily Valentine in Beverly Hills 99219, is it true that they were considering doing a spin-off with that character? Yeah, Melrose Place. She was going to be the spinoff character from Melrose Place. They were going to take him, and, and uh, we just didn't make a deal. Like, they offered me money that I didn't think was good enough, and I said no. And, that, and then they created the Grant Show character, the Jake character that Grant Show played, and they spun him off instead, which is fine. People always think that I must regret that, but I wasn't a fan of, um, I wasn't a fan of Melrose Place. It didn't have the sort of heart and soul that 90210 had, and I knew mm. it wouldn't. And um I, I knew it wouldn't. So that's why I wanted more money to do it than they were willing to give me. I also, uh, everyone assumed that I got 90210 because of Jason, like because Jason and I were together for a couple, for five years. But mm -hmm. I, I met Jason on the show. I'd already gotten the job. I would never have met Jason if I hadn't gotten the job. Right. So, uh, and it, but I, because people already assumed that, uh, and then if I got Melrose Place too, the world would assume that my entire career was due to the person that I was living with, and it wasn't but it would have felt that way. And that's a bad way to feel. I don't regret it at all. The show wasn't good. <laughs> I didn't like Melrose Place at all. So I would have been unhappy doing it. So I'm glad that I didn't do it. And actually everything was thanks to your lucky hat. Yeah, 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 indeed. So you mentioned your directorial debut, Bathing and the Single Girl. Have you got any plans to do a follow-up or write some more books perhaps? You know, not, not right, not currently, no. Um, the short, it was fun. Um, the only real world for shorts is the film festival circuit. And I did that heavily. I programmed film festivals for like 16 years and I was really heavily involved in the, the, the you know, the regional film festival market for a long time. Mm. Um, but it's expensive. It's, you know, you have, it costs to submit between, you know, between 15 and $75 per film, film festival to submit. And I don't know, I, I did a hundred film festivals with that film and I, I went, I met a lot of people and had a lot of fun, but it's not something I, I aspire to do uh, anymore. I'd love to write another book, but that's a massive undertaking. And it's not the kind of thing I can force, but somebody told me that they ever wrote a book uh, inspired by the short that they could get me a three book deal that was very motivating and I wrote that book in eight weeks oh, wow. um <laughs> then they couldn't get me a book deal <laughs> so I had to publish it myself um and that was sort of disheartening too it's 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 it hasn't gotten the traction that I think it deserves because it didn't have a legitimate you know a, an actual big publishing house behind it I think a lot of people don't realize that bookstores where you, where a book sits in a bookstore is paid for by the publishers mm -hmm. so the end of the caps thing you know the end of aisles that costs a certain amount to have the book placed there costs even on the shelves if they're if they're on the shelf with the binding out or with the cover out that is something you pay for and I don't have the pockets deep enough to pay for that sort of placement in a store so you need a giant publishing house to do that for you and you know I think my book would be a great airport book it's a it's a really easy read it's a it's sort of a uh, you know a, a guilty pleasure sort of a beach read book and I think it'd be great for airplanes and it'd be really well it was at an airport bookstore but it never will be so that was discouraging and I, I, I just don't I, I just don't feel super motivated to to you know bleed uh, bleed onto the page for another 
six months to have nobody care. <laughs> I'm really proud of the book. The book is fucking awesome. Uh, and I'm really, really proud of it. Well, I encourage everybody to go and seek out that book, buy one for your friends as well. And hopefully we can get some more books from you in the future. It's on Amazon. It's only 10 bucks and it'd make a good stocking stuffer, but make, just know that it's pretty raunchy and scandalous. So don't give it to anybody who's conservative. <laughs> Maybe they need it the most. Maybe they won't like it though. <laughs> it's another sale. Yeah. I don't care if they like it or not. That's the spirit. So you've starred in so many other shows as well, stuff like Baywatch and ER, LA Firefighters, Judging Amy, Get Short in tons more. What's been your single most enjoyable experience on set? You know, I have to give credit to the to both Nine Hundred Two and O and to, and to, and to Child's Play because these they've been their family for me. Hmm. I mean, you know, I did Nine Hundred Two and O and I lived with Jason for five years. That was a lovely experience in my life. Jason and his wife, his wife's one of my best friends. They're my family. They're who I, they're, I spend my holidays with. So that's been like, they're literally my family. Um, and that's true of Alex Vincent and Don Mancini too. And this summer spending so much time in Canada with Jennifer Tilly and Fiona, I got a lot closer to them than I had been before. So it's not it, another misconception people have, they think like, you can walk off a set with a Chucky doll and you cannot, is that everybody's best friends or that you stay best friends with everybody you've ever worked with. It's very difficult to because at the nature of the job is that we're scattered around the world doing different projects. And, so, and Alex and I don't even live in the same town. He lives in Florida and I live in California. Um, so it's unusual to get people, to meet people on a, on a job and have them stay in your life for 30 years. So for that reason, um, those two are my favorite. I love that. And can you tell me what you might be working on next? Of course, you've got your, your YouTube show and all this other good stuff you're doing. Have you got any plans for the coming months that you can reveal? I, I don't have any um, projects planned and it's the holidays now. So nothing really happens between now and next year. Um, I do a lot of horror convention, horror conventions though, you know, public appearances where I show and I'll sign, sign things for people. And um, uh, I have four or five of them booked already for next year. Uh, assuming that I'm not in Canada shooting Chucky. Uh, if I am, then those things will have to be, have to wait. But um, if people go to my Instagram account and they can, I post whenever I'm going to be at a convention um, on there. So people can see where I'm going to be and maybe show up. They're really fun. They're great to do. That's fantastic. And hopefully if you can come over to the UK for a future convention, we can do one of these in person as well. Yeah, I actually am, I, I, you know, schedule permitting, I think I'm doing one in in the UK. I don't know where though. I don't know if it's Manchester again or somewhere in the UK though. And I think November of 2022. Um, Amazing. Well, we'll that, have to catch up then. Yeah, um, and by then, whether or not I'm in season two of Chucky, it probably will have aired. So, or be airing <laughs> at the time. You know, if it hasn't aired, it will be have being aired. So, be a lot to talk about. It's very true. And so, my final question: Have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell Show and your fans around the world? Have I got a message to, to give people? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll tell you what. Uh, get vaccinated. Wear a mask when you're, you know, wear, don't be a douche. This, these, these are measures. The whole world's in hell, and we're never going to get out of it if we don't all act as a team. I, I, I don't know how divided the rest of the world is, but this country is... Um, Donald Trump just mind fucked half the country. So 40, only 49% of Americans are vaccinated. And I saw um, a thing on the news say, today saying that there's a direct correlation between, you know, areas, counties and stuff in the United States that voted for Trump. The, the, the more strongly the county voted for Trump, the less likely they are to be vaccinated. Trump communities are dying at three times the rate that uh, oh, that Biden cat counties are. That's because they're being lied to and they're yeah. really dying. It's not a lie. I don't know how these people think that Donald Trump even admitted he had COVID. So, and that he would, he, he missed he had it, but they still think it's a hoax. I don't know. It's not a hoax. People are fucking dying and we need to, we're never going to have life back to normal if everyone doesn't get on board. So that's my primary message. A lot of people that are telling their supporters not to get vaccinated were yeah. vaccinated themselves. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. They all are. 
Yeah, every single senator is, and every and all these new, even the, the the anchors on Fox News that are telling people it's they're all vaccinated. It's so immoral. It's unbelievably immoral to 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 protect yourself and then tell people who listen to you and take your advice that they shouldn't bother. It's 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 like manslaughter. I don't know how they're getting away with it. I don't know how they live with themselves. It's outrageous. That's horrific. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I've really loved celebrating your career. I loved everything that you're working in. I'm really excited to see what you're going to appear in next and really hope everybody buys your book as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope to one day send you a photo of your book in an airport. That would be fantastic. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Christine, Elise, thank you so much for your time today. Nice to meet you. Have a happy holiday. Happy holidays to you too. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Bye.